content that is helpful for us to see uh, people's faces. <clears throat> Um, and just so you know as well, while we will be recording today's session, um, as Kelsey shared, um, if you do want to participate but don't wish uh, for your name to be associated with your sharing or your voice to be associated, um, you can feel free to put it in the chat and we can read that out for you um, without that association. Um, but we do encourage folks to unmute and share um, at different points. We'll have some questions and discussion points. We're excited to um, with you all. Um, so with that, I suppose we will um, introduce ourselves. Um, my name is Bridget Kessner, uh, she, her, and I am the um, Education and Youth Services Coordinator with the Connecticut Alliance to End Sexual Violence. I've been with the Alliance for the last four years, uh, previously with the Post-Conviction Victim Act, and before that I was with the Rape Crisis Center of Milford. Um, so I have some history in this work that I'm definitely excited to share in the context of today's presentations and the sessions to follow. Um, and I'm so glad to see so many registrants here today. And my name is Kelsey Alexander. I use they, them pronouns. I am relatively new to the Alliance. I've been here for about a month, although I have gotten to see many of you at a few trainings over the last month. Um, I am the training and prevention coordinator at the Alliance and I'm just so excited to be here with you all. Great. Um, so, before we get started, um, just a couple of quick notes, of course, to respect the confidentiality of uh, those who are here. Um, so if people share information, um, you know, just uh, with you, ensure that you're respecting that. Again, while this is recorded, we still want to just, um, you know, ensure that uh, we are respectful of whatever folks might share. Um, and then additionally, uh, we just ask that you please mute yourselves unless you're actively speaking, um, just so that we're not getting that background noise that we can sometimes hear on, um, on Zoom. So as Kelsey mentioned at the start as well, um, we do recognize that today as, uh, you know, we'll be discussing a topic that can be particularly difficult for folks and understandably so. Um, child sexual abuse is a very heavy topic, and um, you know I know that many of you in doing this work understand what those statistics look like, understand how common this is. So it touches people's lives professionally and personally, and we want to ensure um, that our attendees are taking really good care of themselves uh, following today's program. Um, so what we wanted to do is have everybody commit to an act or a couple of acts of self-care that they're going to um, take part in following today's session, whether it's immediately after, whether it's after work, um, but we want to commit to uh, an act of self-care that works best for you. So what I just ask that everyone will do is to take out a piece of paper. Um, if you don't have one in front of you, um, if you wanna do it you know, digitally, that's totally cool too. Um, but I just ask that you take just a minute here to think of and write down um, an act of self-care that you are going to engage in just following today's program. Um, and we will remind everyone to take part in those uh, actions at the conclusion of today's program. So if it's helpful for anybody to hear an example, I had already written mine down. Um, so my self-care plans are to um, play with my dog, um, to then uh, have some snuggle time with him on the couch, and I want to um, get to bed early and get a really good rest tonight. So those are my plans for self-care. Would anybody else like to share self-care plans? Feel free to put it in the chat or um, to unmute if you'd like to share. I knew you'd be sharing about your dog, or I assume so, Bridget, and I'll be doing the same. I'll be petting Lily and taking her for a walk later. And also Wonderful. I plan to laugh, and that's an important part of my life. Awesome, thank you so much for sharing. I see you going shopping, sit in the sun, and read, bowling, take a walk, go for a run, watch friends, cook a yummy dinner, drive home with my convertible down in the sun, that's lovely. Uh, swimming, very nice, drink a lot of water. Yeah, make sure to stay hydrated and take care of yourselves in today's heat, folks. Uh, snacks and doodles, nice. 
Um, thank you all so much for sharing. And please, you know, now that we've written these down and shared some of them, please, um, you know, ensure you take part in these later um, because we want to ensure you're all taking care of yourselves as we engage in uh, conversations about what can be a difficult topic. Um, Kelsey, is there anything else you'd like to add in our introduction here? Um, just that Bridget and I will hang out. The uh, Today's session is gonna end at three o'clock, but Bridget and I will hang out for a little while on the end of the session, um, in case that we're gonna make some time for Q&A at the end, but in case people have lingering questions or if anybody just wants to check in or process something that came up for you today in the training, um, we will be available at the end of the workshop. So feel free to, to hang out and check in with us. Absolutely, thank you, Kelsey. All right, so with that, um, we're just gonna get started with uh, some basic information about um, child sexual abuse and some of uh, the misunderstandings that have been, uh, you know, shared over the years about the topic, um, some things that, um, you know, are now understood to be best practice or uh, understood as the dynamics of CSA. Um, so with that, we're just going to get started by sharing some statistics, um, including that 30 to 50 percent of instances of child sexual assault uh, involve the harmful sexual behavior of another child. Um, and we need to acknowledge that fact because often these conversations are only had in the context of an adult harming a child. But of course, as we can see in the statistic, there are many cases that would need our attention that don't necessarily fit that narrative. So as we're utilizing examples today and having discussions today, um, I ensured that we included examples of situations between um, you know, two minors. Um, it's also important to acknowledge whether it's another child or an adult, um, children are more likely to be harmed by someone they know, which of course is something I know you all understand as advocates, um, but only 3% to 9% of those who harm children are strangers to that child. Um, there's some variation in that statistic due to what is you know, defined as a stranger. Um, so there was a very common narrative, of course, that I know you also have all heard, which is uh, stranger danger, right? And there was this stranger danger panic that really began in the 1980s. Um, so this was primarily in response to actually a single high profile case and a great deal of media attention that surrounded it. Um, a case in which there was a young boy who was unfortunately abducted by a stranger. Um, and then from there, it kind of took a life of its own. Actually, it was used as an opportunity, unfortunately, by uh, some homophobic people in the country um, to kind of push back on an increase in LGBTQ visibility and LGBTQ rights. Um, and they kind of perpetuated this harmful narrative about, uh, you know, quote unquote, predatory gay men that would harm children in their communities. Um, we actually still see the stranger danger narrative um, play out even when those words aren't utilized. Um, and even though this is not necessarily commonplace anymore um, in terms of community education, but um, I'm sure it's something you may have seen or heard um, in narratives uh, in response to transphobia, right? When there are um, debates about, uh, you know, who can and can't use bathrooms, right? And they talk about uh, the safety of children as a concern. Um, so we're unfortunately seeing um, this misconception applied in a way that's really harmful to different communities today. So other than its origin, um, what makes stranger danger problematic? Uh, well, um, it, of course, perpetuates misunderstandings about the dynamic of child sexual abuse, right? Um, and we want to understand it in order to address it. Um, in the case of an emergency as well, um, whether a child is lost, if there's an attempted abduction or something of that nature, um, a child may have to seek help from a stranger, right? If they aren't with a trusted adult, if they can't turn to a trusted adult in the situation. Um, and this is especially true for folks who may not be, uh, you know, feel safe or be safe approaching law enforcement. Um, so we really um, put children in a position where we uh, share a narrative that they should be afraid of strangers, right? But also that they need to be obedient to adults, um, which is, definitely something that contradicts itself um, and can potentially put children in a situation where they're unsafe if they do indeed need to um, refer to an adult uh, that they are not as familiar with. We also know that children are uh, much more likely to be groomed beforehand than experience an isolated instance of sexual violence. So typically child sexual abuse 
would follow a path of normal and healthy boundaries to then boundary violations, then to grooming behaviors, and then to sexual abuse. Um, so our goal and what we'll be talking about through this program is intervening and addressing at the point of the boundary violation. Um, so really ensuring we have that early intervention to uh, prevent the grooming and sexual abuse uh, from occurring whenever possible. Um, but it's important that we acknowledge these dynamics kind of as we walk through the rest of the information today. So while I know some of it may be uh, repetitive for folks, it's always kind of worth repeating. Um, so with that, I will uh, hand it over to Kelsey to talk a little bit about uh, CSA's public health problem. So this is also sort of a new understanding um, of many forms of violence, not just child sexual abuse, that we are viewing these, um, whether it's sexual violence, uh, intimate partner violence, we're viewing these things through a public health lens and as public health problems. Um, so that's sort of a, and we're going to talk a little bit more in a bit about sort of why that's useful to us um, with child sexual abuse specifically. So that's one thing that we know about it. Um, the other thing is that, and I'm sure this is very familiar to many of us, we know that child sexual abuse is also considered an ACE or an adverse childhood experience. And there has been a lot of research into the ACEs that you can see up on the screen right now. Um, and specifically how an accumulation of ACEs or of adverse childhood experiences. Um, there's lots of research, research tying these things to adverse health outcomes for adults, for adolescents, for people down the road. Um, so child sexual abuse along with um, physical abuse and neglect is considered an adverse childhood experience um, that specifically can lead to higher rates of future mental health and physical health concerns. Um, there's chronic health problems associated with experiencing sexual abuse as a child, um, STIs, depression, PTSD, suicidality. These are just some of the, some, some of these fairly obvious, maybe um, potential health outcomes for somebody who might've experienced this as a child. Um, but there's other things too, like ACEs are connected to uh, things like heart, heart issues and um, stomach issues and chronic pain and things like that. Um, so now that we know this about child sexual abuse, that really implores all of us to, to take this even more seriously. Um, and even within the conversation about ACEs, there are disparities when we look at gender and we look at sexuality. Um, so women are more likely to report sexual abuse as kids. Um, some of this may also have to do, uh, as I'm sure many of you are familiar with, um, just the differences in reporting between girls and boys and men and women. Um, and we're obviously we're having this whole conversation within the context of a gender binary because that is how our research most often is done. Um, but also when we look at LGBTQ folks, they are also more likely to experience sexual abuse and, and generally to have a higher number of ACEs compared to non LGBTQ peers. So this is just a helpful framework also for thinking about child sexual abuse and why it's so important to do something about it. Um, so with that, we'll share a little bit about um, what disclosure looks like. Um, so we know that only about one in four children who experience uh, child sexual abuse will disclose while they are still in their childhood. Um, so with that being said, there are a lot of considerations that we need to have, right? We need to consider what barriers may prevent uh, minors from disclosing child sexual abuse so that we can address those barriers. We need to consider the physical and mental health issues that may arise if a child does not disclose that abuse, right? And talking about um, not only ACEs, but what could be going on at the present time for that child. Um, we also need to consider what happens to them over the course of their lifetime if nobody believes the disclosure, the person that they disclose to does not believe them, um, or if uh, there is not action taken to stop the behaviors that are harming them. Um, so when we talk about uh, disclosure, we know that uh, child disclosing sexual abuse may bring up a lot of feelings uh, for adults, whether they are um, you know, community partners, whether they're advocates themselves, um, whether they may be parents or um, just you know, community members, um, there may be some concerns around facilitating or um, managing disclosures from youth. 
Um, so with that, we actually wanted to uh, put out a poll to everybody. Kelsey, if you wouldn't mind putting that up. Um, but we just wanted to gauge your own confidence. Um, and of course, um, you know, we'll just see the percentages and not uh, necessarily who's responding, but we wanna see how confident um, you feel about handling a child's disclosure of sexual violence. Give it like five more seconds. All right. I can, here's our results. So we've got um, the majority of folks are falling into the somewhat confident uh, category for how you're feeling about responding to disclosures, which is a great place to be in. And particularly as you make your way through our three part summer institute, hopefully that is we maybe we'll do this poll again at the end of the institute and we'll see uh, where folks are falling because our goal is that you will then feel very confident. Um, but I also just want to validate for the folks that are in the not very confident category that that is really normal. Um, and I think, you know, given our sort of our professional demographic here, like where we're all coming from, some of us have had training on this topic before. Um, some of us may have had training, but but it was a long time ago, or we don't feel like we got a lot out of that particular training or whatever. Um, and it's okay if you're not feeling super confident. That's what this training, and in particular, the one in July, that's what that is really going to cover. So we are our goal today is to create a space where people feel uh, no judgment from us or from anybody here in the workshop with us. Um, if you have questions, please ask them. If you have a question, I guarantee somebody else in this workshop has the same question. So please ask it. This is not a place to feel like, oh, I should really know this already. So let me not ask. Absolutely. Um, so with that being said, and with you all, you know, sharing your um, confidence levels here, I wanted to kind of open up, um, you know, a discussion question just to see um, when you think about receiving a disclosure of child sexual abuse, um, how does that off the bat make you feel and why do you feel that way? Um, so that's something, feel free to unmute yourselves, feel free to share in the chat. Um, Kelsey, if you don't mind switching slides, I know I have a slide with the question in case. Um, yep, awesome, thank you. Um, so would anybody like to share their thoughts or feelings about that? start us off Bridget I mean I think that one of the things for me is that because this is what I do quote unquote professionally right like I everywhere we go in every parent space in every sort of realm of my world right we sort of get these disclosures I think as a family but also in particular I do and I think that every single time whether it is a legislator calling whether it is somebody sitting at one of my daughter's softball games I feel a lot of anxiety and a heightened sense of like I'm going to mess something up right and I'm somebody who has done this work for a really long time somebody who feels I was one of the very confident right in being able to do that but they're you know 20 years in, there remains every single time when it comes to kids, a certain level of both anxiety and just heightened awareness of um, having a lot of responsibility, um, you know, in that moment to get it right, quote unquote, I guess would be my most common feelings. <clears throat> Absolutely. Thank you for sharing. Um, I see in the chat as well, we have um, makes me feel sad because knowing this is occurring to a child is just so devastating. Um, I'd say I feel sad and nervous as well, um, sick because it's a child and also nervous because I don't wanna traumatize them further. Um, absolutely, and of course, seeing a lot of similar patterns here. Um, anybody else wanna share? So I feel the same way Beth does. You know, we've been doing this for so long and you know, we get so many disclosures, being in the school systems, being in the community, being around family members um, and having someone speak up. And so I do a lot of breathing a lot of breathing, <laughs> like when the kid is disclosing, I'm doing a lot of mindfulness with myself, but still being in the present and trying to stay really calm uh, because no matter what that kid throws at you, the less reaction you can have, the better it is for them to stay calm. You know, if you stay calm, they'll stay calm. So, Absolutely. yeah. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of pressure associated, I think, with that experience for folks, um, especially, you know, I know um, children are 
in a position where we're kind of required to jump into action more so than if it were an adult disclosing to us, right? In following um, the survivor and allowing them to drive the bus, um, we are often in a position with adults where they might tell us that they don't want to address the violence. And, and then we aren't in a position where um, we need to move forward, uh, you know, through a law enforcement process or a medical process. But with children, of course, um, because of mandated reporting, we're in a position where we know that there's going to be uh, action moving forward, right? Um, and it never gets easier. Right. And that's, of course, you get, it never gets easier. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that's, of course, situations where um, we're talking about disclosures of um, ongoing you know, or current, you know, child sexual abuse. But there's, of course, also situations where we get disclosures from people who experienced it a long time ago. Um, nervous because all children communicate differently, whether through body language, humor, short statements, etc. So being able to communicate with them so they feel comfortable and safe and not a burden. Absolutely. Um, make me feel as if I'm able to assist them so that they can become mentally healthy adults. Yep. Um, so I appreciate everybody sharing their um, thoughts and feelings about this. Again, we can see some common patterns. Um, it's definitely clear that there's, uh, you know, some nervousness here due to some of the pressure that this creates. Um, you know, folks want to ensure that they're really getting it right. Um, it's something that, of course, um, is going to make us sad. It's going to have that emotional impact on us as well, um, given the significance of that experience for a child, right? So I definitely appreciate you all sharing um, what your thoughts and feelings are about disclosure. Um, we want to- yes. Sorry, this is, this is Cindy from Milford. Um, I too would like to say, even though I feel very, pretty confident, very confident when a child discloses, probably because of the differences now with the MDT and the CAC and protocols being in place, certainly. It still though makes you feel anxious and as Beth was saying you want to get it right because what occurs to me as well yes there's a protocol I'm very encouraged by the fact that police are being trained and know how to respond and children are not being questioned over and over again um, and can have that forensic interview but I also think beyond that to the child is disclosing and it's like throwing a, a stone into a pond and the ripple effects for all the family members and how that's going to impact the child so it's a as we all know like you said it doesn't it's not easy it's a complicated process but i am encouraged by the strides we've made since i joined the center many years ago having to show up at police departments at all hours with officers that may not have been trained in knowing how to talk with children and how to react so i am encouraged by that Absolutely. And I really appreciate that input because um, we absolutely need to recognize the spaces where we have made strides in ways that have been more supportive to uh, children because we want to continue to um, take those steps. Right. So um, I can definitely appreciate that perspective. So thank you. Um, so uh, we do want to um, ensure that we have all this information um, because, you know, like I said, we will be talking about uh, some of this, in, some of this uh, information around disclosures in our um, next session. Um, but with that, I will hand it over to Kelsey to talk a little bit about protective factors. All right. So we are going to do a quick breakout room um, sort of brainstorm with, you're going to have four to five people in a room. And what we want you to just talk about for, I'm probably only gonna give you like three minutes. Um, what are some things when we think about child sexual abuse, what keeps kids safe? Just off, off the top of your head, or you know, if you know some stuff from, if you've read about protective factors for this, feel free to share those, but what is gonna keep kids safe? So I will send you away and I will call you back in about three minutes and just be prepared to share a few things from each group if you could, thank you.
we're doing all right on time. I was just going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very impressed with us. <laughs> Me too. All right, they should be back in 30 seconds. Welcome back, welcome back. I'm sure we're gonna have some people whose conversations were just so engaging that they're gonna spend the next 30 seconds still in their groups, which is fine. <laughs> I hear you. Are you trying to say something? I'm taking off his headphones. All right. Welcome back, everybody. Okay. So, what did we come up with? What are some things we think could keep kids safe in terms of uh, child sexual abuse? Anybody can share. Well, we talked about. <laughs> two things, says Lucy um, Marisol and I about, um, one is teaching kids about that they, uh, about consent, that they control their bodies. Um, and then the other is to teach adults what grooming behaviors look like so they can pay attention to what's going on. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. We talked about education too, and we also um, talked about having that open communication with a trusted adult that makes the child feel safe. Um, so someone who's teaching them what feels right and what's wrong with their body um, and being able to go from there and having that communication if they don't feel safe. Great. Yeah, in our group, uh, I was with Jessica, Gina, and I forgot name Bradley <laughs> yeah uh, Bradley we also agree that communication is, it is important in order to keep our kids safe and it is a trick situation because based on the statistics the child sexual abuse uh it is only a seven percent that come from a stranger so breaking that like the stranger danger and include everyone in our conversation with them making that connection and that they feel comfortable if something happened to them that they can come to us and talk and communication and education educating yeah the kids and the adults uh, around them without making them feel like you said at the beginning that they're going to be afraid to trust anyone because they're going to if something happened they they're going to say who do i talk to because everyone can be a, so but basically yeah we all agree that education is key and also mm -hmm you know, uh, making that connection where our kids that they feel safe to come to us and tell us like if something happened to them. Excellent. Yeah, and that is gonna be a key part of our, some of our discussion later today, um, just about creating more adults that kids feel comfortable disclosing to um, or talking to before there's even a need to disclose, just kids coming to an adult when something feels a little bit wrong, right? Um, so we will we will talk more about that later. And I am not surprised to hear so much of like the education and that we need more awareness around this issue, right? That's so much of what many of us are doing in our day-to-day -day work. So this concept of protective factors, which is what you all have been sort of brainstorming, um, this is this comes from this is like a public health thing. Um, we can talk about protective factors for a number of different issues in the world. 
the protective factors I'm going to show you in just a second are ones that have been figured, you know, people have done research um, to figure out what is effective in preventing child sexual abuse. That is not to say there aren't other things. So some of the things you all mentioned, you're not going to see on the screen, but they're all important, right? So these are some of the protective factors that people have identified. So some of the, you know, we talked a lot about like having good relationships and good communication, right? That's on there. Having safe and positive relationships with caregivers, super important. Um, but some of this stuff is a little more big picture, right? So having your basic needs met, that's a protective factor for child sexual abuse. So having enough food, having a safe place to stay, having your heat and having air conditioning available in your home so that you feel comfortable being there, right? Um, Emotional support in that that can look like a lot of different things, but certainly within a family and not just for like kids having emotional support, but for all the people in the family, the adults need it as well. Um, families that have strong social support networks. So relationships with other people in their community or other family members, other friends, the more positive relationships that a whole family has, the less likely that the kids in that family are going to experience CSA. Um, when we have caregivers, this might sound sort of, um, sort of obvious, but kids who get a lot of supervision or have, you know, have caregivers who are able to be home with them and able to, uh, pay a lot of attention to them. So these are some of the things also, and then there's one on there about like enforcing rules and monitoring behavior. So having some structure, having boundaries and having adults who are really doing the work of enforcing those boundaries and making sure that, um, other people outside of the family are also respecting those boundaries, right? So with many of the things on this list, we can sort of peel back the layers and think about what might enable or prevent some of these protective factors from existing within a family or within a community, right? And so some of this, we can, we can deal with some of it through education, but not all of it. Like think about what what needs to happen for like everyone in a community to have all of their basic needs met, right? That is a much bigger systemic problem we're talking about. Um, or even what it means for kids to have like adults that are able to watch them, able to supervise them, able to pay attention to them all the time, right? We know so many families, that's just really not an option for them because folks are working. Maybe there's not great daycare, childcare, after school care in certain communities. Um, so many of these are things that it feel, it sort of feels a little bit out of our control to do anything about. Um, but we are here to talk about the things that we do have some control over and ways that we can mitigate some of this risk. Any questions about protective factors? Folks should also feel free, Bridget and I, I know we can just sort of get on a roll and be talking. Feel free to interrupt us at any point. If you've got a question or comment, put it in the chat, we will address it, I promise. I just wanted to say, Kelsey, that the addressing the in, uh, the intergenerational aspects of sexual violence, you know, is so important. And when you have healthy parents, it's more likely that you're having, you know, that you'll be able to pass that on to, you know, to healthy children. I mean, emotionally healthy children. Um, so, and a lot of times that's not happening. So you're starting off kind of in a, you know, a difficult place. And then also um, the bonding of parents with the infants when they're born, things like that. You know, those are bigger, more specific things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Sunny. We see some of that with the ACEs as well, right? So one ACE that was on that list you might've seen um, is violence towards, they specifically say a mother. I think, you know, violence towards a caregiver, violence towards an adult who is who is who loves you and is taking care of you, right? Um, that that, unfortunately, like, if a, if a kid has experienced that in their home, that that puts them at risk for, for more issues down the road, including like a heightened risk of sexual violence, um, of experiencing it. So you're right that there, there is an intergenerational element to all of this. Thanks for bringing that in. Okay, so Bridget was sort of alluding to this earlier, but we wanna just talk for a second, and this is gonna be a bigger focus of our third Summer Institute workshop where we talk more about prevention. Um, our understanding of preventing child sexual abuse has changed in some ways. There's some ways in which we're still doing things the same, but th th it has changed in a few ways. So with the knowledge of some of these protective factors, 
we are now many of us like taking up sort of a bigger picture look right so it's not just what are the individual behaviors of all the kids and all the adults in a certain town or in a certain school system it's also do those like does the town does our government do our communities support people um, in having access to child care and having everything they need to have their basic needs met right so when we know the protective factors, we're also responsible for thinking about some of this bigger picture stuff. But another big shift that has started to happen in CSA prevention is that, and this goes back a little bit to some of the like stranger danger stuff. There's been a lot of emphasis previously on teaching kids how to keep themselves safe, which I'm sure particularly for folks who are parents or who have kids in their lives, like we do that all the time. But we also really need to be shifting our focus onto adults and acknowledging and recognizing that it is adults responsibility to prevent child sexual abuse from happening. Right. Adults are the only people who can actually like a child cannot. Sorry, I'm trying to mute whoever is. My name is usually pretty good on it. Okay. Um, a child is not actually capable of preventing violence against themselves right? Adults need to make sure that that happens. So that's going to be a big focus on with, with our conversation today. We are talking about what we as adults can do in terms of our relationships with other adults in the world or things we are paying attention to in the world. How can we be talking to other adults to prevent them from harming young people? Um, and as Bridget mentioned earlier, that obviously doesn't account for all instances, you know, there are in plenty of instances of child sexual abuse that include only children, right? Children harming other kids. Um, and so we'll talk about that as well. But this is just a big, a big shift, right? We're not making the kids responsible for fixing this. And then some of the ways that our understanding of child sexual abuse has unfortunately stayed the same and where we still have some work to shift some things. Um, as Bridget mentioned earlier, there are definitely some folks and some programs out in the world sort of keeping this idea, whether it's stranger danger or we just need kids to protect themselves, like keeping those ideas going out in the world. Um, also, we know that, sorry, I'm currently the only person, I gotta make somebody else able to mute. Uh, so it takes me a second when I'm talking, but I'll switch that over, Bridget, like you asked in a second. Um, we are, in terms of responding to child sexual abuse, we're sort of limited in our options, right? We are, we are very reliant upon the criminal legal system to handle situations like this and on DCF. Um, and obviously both of these institutions, there's issues with the way families feel about working, whether that's with the police or with DCF, um, there's certainly been a lot of harm done in families in many situations. So just to acknowledge like our, our system for responding, if we had way more options, it would probably feel a lot better. So there's still a lot of work here to do. All right, and I think I'm gonna hand it over to Bridget and then I will get somebody else to help me mute. Great, thank you so much, Kelsey. Um, so we're going to be talking a little bit about grooming dynamics. Um, again, I just want to acknowledge the difficulty um, in, you know, speaking about and hearing about this topic sometimes, as I will be giving some specific examples. Um, but, um, you know, I think examples can definitely help us to understand what some of these dynamics look like. Um, so, um, Kelsey, if you don't mind switching the slide. Um, so what does grooming look like? Um, you know, we understand, of course, that building trust with families and communities to increase uh, access to the child is a really significant piece of what this looks like, right? Those who um, abuse children often um, groom that child, but also groom their family and groom the community that they're in, um, in order to be a trusted person in that community and gain that access. Um, unfortunately, this can create disbelief upon that child disclosing or when they attempt to potentially get help, right? When they say that something made them uncomfortable, but they state who it was with, um, they may unfortunately be disbelieved if there are adults in that community that really uh, trust that person. Um, it can make that child even more hesitant to potentially come forward, right? If they know that this is somebody who is essentially beloved, someone that they're supposed to trust, um, they may hesitate even more than a child may already uh, do. 
It's also important to consider the trauma that this creates within communities, right? So in a situation in which this is somebody that everybody has trusted, allowed in their homes, allowed alone with their children, what does it mean when it comes out, right? That this person has, um, has created this level of harm uh, in the life of a child or children. Um, so this can create a, you know, a real ripple effect in terms of the trauma that a community faces um, once this comes out. Um, and it's important to consider how this allows sexual violence to continue to be perpetrated, right? This person continues to operate in this community that trusts them. They continue to build on that trust. There are uh, children who are harmed, who are more afraid to come forward. Um, so of course, a uh, couple of high profile examples, if we consider the Nasser case, right? Many of um, the girls in USA Gymnastics talked about um, being assaulted while their parents were actually in the room with them. Um, this is somebody who had created a great deal of trust with these families. Also considering um, Penn State, right? Sandusky became sort of a surrogate father figure in certain ways to the boys uh, who he harmed and spent time building relationships with the adults as much as he spent time building relationships with those children. Um, so it's important to consider what that looks like in our communities um, as we consider what, um, what uh, adults are doing to groom children. Of course, they also build trust with that child. So they position themselves as a strong and safe presence in that child's life, especially, uh, you know, considering those protective factors, right? If that child otherwise has an absence of that sort of support. Um, so for instance, um, you know, there was a case where a father who, um, a father had taken over care of his child after she had been neglected by her mother due to a drug addiction had been uh, removed from the home by DCF and placed with the father. Um, and after for some time creating a safe home for his daughter, he began to erode uh, boundaries within the home, treating her more like an adult, um, which actually ended up leading up to uh, acts of sexual abuse against her. Um, so that trust was built to a child who was particular or with a child that was particularly vulnerable by an adult that um, you know, she was supposed to trust in order to initiate that kind of harm. In addition, um, the child may be isolated. Um, so they may be isolated uh, from their adult supports. Um, they may be um, isolated from uh, age appropriate peers, right? In a situation in which they're being harmed by another child. Um, for instance, uh, there was a case with a trusted um, camp counselor who would tell the younger teen girls um, at the camp that were, you know, the counselors in training, um, people like that, that he was having um, car troubles. And so he would bring one of them out to the parking lot in order to help them and uh, say, you know, that she was his uh, go-to person to help, right? Um, but meanwhile, actually would end up committing an act of sexual violence against the girl that was helping him. So he would put them in these positions where he was spending more time alone with them and in a physical space where they were isolated. Um, but it's important to recognize as well that it, that isolation can occur even um, potentially without that same level of removal from a physical space. Um, requesting a child to keep secrets uh, is definitely another significant one. Right, we talk about privacy versus secrecy. Um, we want to encourage, um, you know, youth to have some privacy, um, and we'll talk a little bit about what that looks like. Uh, you know, what an appropriate level of privacy might look like for a child, and how we can, um, you know, empower children to have some autonomy through um, maintaining some level of privacy in their lives. However, um, secrecy can definitely hold um, a more significant, uh, you know, level of concern, um, given that it is in the context of a relationship with another person and potentially a person who is harming them. So for instance, another case example where uh, there was an older stepbrother who abused his stepsister um, and said he had you know, a secret nickname for her that only they would use and only when they were alone. Um, this then escalated as they continued to build that relationship um, to him letting her watch a TV show that she wasn't supposed to watch because she was too young, right? But her stepbrother was kind of going to help her out and watch that show with her. Um, and then ultimately, um, when he actually contacted her sexually, um, asked her to keep that a secret as well. So the nickname was a secret. The TV show was a secret. They started having some of these secrets. And then ultimately, the sexual contact was just another one of those secrets. 
Um, so that's kind of the way that those uh, secrets can be an element of grooming. Of course, beginning to erode different um, boundaries in that relationship is a significant element of grooming. So um, we recognize boundaries as a set of personal expectations that communicate our needs. And sometimes there are needs for space. Sometimes there are um, needs not to have physical contact, not to have uh, some level of emotional um, contact or intimacy, right? Um, but somebody will begin to overstep those boundaries and then they will justify or uh, deny those boundary violations most of the time, whether it be to that child or to other adults. Um, so for instance, uh, there was a case with an uncle who abused his uh, nieces um, and he had some excessive affectionate contact with the girls in the family, um, but would then defend it to, uh, you know, girl, the girls as they got, you know, potentially uncomfortable with that, right? They might not want to kiss their uncle. They might not want to be held by him, especially if they felt too old to be held. You might not want to sit in his lap. Um, but he would continuously use the excuse that, you know, well, we're family, right? This is what family does. We're an affectionate family. Um, so that's a situation where those um, boundaries started to be crossed physically and there was some justification and denial of the uh, discomfort that those children were experiencing. Um, you know, another case where there was a teacher who got her student's number and began texting him after school. So we see that's a case where there's kind of this level of emotional intimacy that's inappropriate, right? For a teacher to be contacting a child in that way, beginning to text him. And ultimately that was a situation as well uh, where it led to that teacher harming that student sexually. Um, emotional identification with children can sometimes be a little bit more difficult to notice. Um, so this is when an adult uh, potentially sort of emotionally identifies more with a child or with children in general than they would their peers. Um, in the case of one child to another, this could be emotional identification with, uh, you know, a younger child. Um, so, for example, um, there was one family uh, that I worked with at one point in time who stated that um, at first really didn't believe that there were any red flags in the situation, right, when um, somebody in the family ended up um, being arrested for abusing several of the uh, female minors. Um, in that family, they really stated that they didn't see it coming. And then at one point, somebody kind of spoke up and said, you know what, I noticed that um, he had just spent too much time with the kids at our family events. He was just always with the kids and not in a way where they were being monitored, but in a way where he was engaging almost as if he was a child, right? When everybody separated out for the kids to sit at the kids table and the adults to eat together, he would still sit with the kids in a kid's chair, even though he didn't have to, they were old enough to eat on their own, right? Um, and they all noticed it. Some of them even discussed it, made fun of him, talked about it with one another, but nobody took it seriously or made any action to kind of address it or follow up on it. Um, so that's a situation where somebody might kind of emotionally identify uh, with a child. Uh, similarly, individuals may engage um, youth in age inappropriate conversations or content or behaviors. Um, so they may model objectifying, sexualizing, or other inappropriate uh, behaviors in front of that child. So for instance, a stepfather who had um, sexualized his wife uh, in front of his stepdaughter through objectifying and sexualizing language, um, you know, touching her sexually in his stepdaughter's presence, then ended up um, harming the, uh, his stepdaughter um, sexually. So while he was um, already making her uncomfortable through kind of displaying these behaviors toward her mother, um, it ended up uh, escalating to that extent. Additionally, uh, you know, this could include exposure to adult movies or adult conversations, um, you know, about things like sex. This could, um, you know, be putting the child in a position where they might feel cool or different, right? Or they're very grown up for their age or something that they might be told. Um, and then it's also important to acknowledge that this can be potentially flipped. So um, there could be situations where there are adults who, in emotionally identifying with children, um, may engage in uh, children's media or children's interests excessively and utilize that as a way to relate to that child. Um, so if they have seen every single episode of a certain children's show, um, backwards and forwards know all about it, and then kind of utilize that to relate to the child, the child may feel as if they can better relate to that adult and see them at the same level to some extent, which can of course become problematic um, when those boundaries are continued to be pushed. 
So with all of that being said, talking about some of these red flags, um, how can adults potentially intervene when they see a red flag? Um, you know, it's sometimes difficult for adults in these situations and recognizing that um, depending on what this behavior looked like, harm may not have yet occurred. They might not have quote unquote enough information, right, to do anything, um, to report to DCF even. Um, but how can adults potentially step in when they're uh, noticing something that could be problematic? Um, you know, it's so critical to be present and active in that moment itself as this is happening to confidently um, inject ourselves into a space um, where this is happening. Voice a concern with that adult about boundary violations. Um, voice concerns with other relevant adults. So perhaps uh, that child's parents, right? Um, you know, perhaps other adults that could um, engage in uh, that conversation with you or engage with that uh, conversation with that other adult with you. Um, and of course, you're going to want to ensure that either you or somebody who is, um, you know, close to that child checks in with them, follows up with them, sees if they felt uncomfortable, um, you know, ensure that they are being taken care of in that situation um, and have a safe space to talk to a safe adult. We, of course, want to advocate for policy creations and then enforcement of those policies, transparency in that policy. So we're in, we're, if we're in a situation, say, with a summer camp, right, with a camp counselor, could there be a policy to say that a camp counselor and um, a counselor in training or you know, camper should not be in a situation where they are alone with that staff person at any time, right? That there always needs to be um, multiple adults in a space. Um, so um, if we are to uh, initiate these policies and then uh, ensure that they are enforced, ensure that um, you know, their management or other adults are being transparent about the expectations and policies in those spaces, we can create safer environments. Of course, we want to continue to model and uphold boundaries um, in order to demonstrate a healthy adult and child dynamic. So this can happen in a variety of situations and it can start at a very young age, right? So um, you can say, you know, did you ask your friend if you could roll that toy car over their body, right? Two children playing. Um, if a child were to spray an adult with water, right? Please be sure to ask next time if I'm, if I'm okay with you spraying me with water. Um, so there are a lot of ways that we can engage in these conversations at age appropriate levels um, to ensure um, that this is uh, these healthy dynamics are normalized. Um, and then what do we do if adults who should be intervening aren't taking action, right? Um, it's important to acknowledge that it's each of our responsibilities to step up in our communities. Um, we want to um, engage other adults in that conversation potentially, right, to ensure that um, there are other folks that might intervene to ensure that somebody's speaking up and saying something about what's going on and making it transparent. Um, we want to remain confident, um, you know, in our assertion that something is uncomfortable. Um, and we want to be transparent and state that something is uncomfortable. We don't want to kind of, um, you know, worry about hurting someone's feelings to the same extent, right? Or just kind of shuffling around it. We want to be transparent about we're, we're having a concern or we're uncomfortable with something and say that um, up front. It's important to acknowledge that uh, child sexual abuse is bred and sustained in silence, right? So silence often comes from discomfort, but we need to push through that discomfort in these situations. Um, if we go back to that family, right, that noticed that red flag about the adult that was just spending much too much time with the children in a way that wasn't appropriate, um, if one of those adults had potentially actually confronted the situation and acknowledged it up front as something that was uncomfortable and needed to be addressed, um, you know, there could have potentially been another outcome, right? So it's important to kind of, um, you know, remain confident um, as we approach these situations and remain transparent in our language. Um, because uh, the worst case scenario, if we are to, um, you know, intervene is that we were wrong. And, you know, I mean, granted, in these situations, you can't even necessarily be wrong, right? Because there's already been a boundary crossed. Um, but worst case scenario, that it's a really uncomfortable situation and that boundary cross was the only one that ever occurred and never will occur, right? Um, worst case scenario of not stepping in is, um, you know, we missed an opportunity to intervene in a situation in which a child was experiencing abuse. Um, so it's important to kind of consider the worst case scenario in situation to ensure that we are stepping in to prevent uh, the worst case scenario, you know, in the situation that we do not. Um, 
And then, you know, as I said, um, in the situation, if you are to approach someone, regardless of their intent or the trajectory of that situation, right, this could be, again, the only boundary violation someone makes, um, it's important to acknowledge that those boundary violations themselves are, are wrong. Um, you know, they cross a line and they are earned to be called out. Um, it also puts children potentially in a situation where they know that there are adults who are watching out for them. There's someone who's gonna check in if they're uncomfortable. Um, so it can kind of create self, uh, safer communities in that respect as well. Um, it's also important to know what resources are potentially available in your community, um, including which you can turn to if one potentially fails to intervene. Um, and that's something we'll be talking a little bit more about in our second session, but I kind of wanted to preface here um, that it's really critical to know all of our resources and options rather than be reliant on a single pathway. Um, so before we're actually gonna hop off for a 10 minute break, I just wanna check in and see if folks have any questions about everything that I just threw at you. Um, I know that there was a lot of information and case examples and I want to leave space for questions. Bridget, I'm going to spend one minute talking about, so at during our last legislative session, there actually, I think for the first time, at least in our Connecticut history, right, there was some legislation that talked about grooming and education around grooming in particular. Um, could you, uh, and or maybe Lucy, uh, share a little bit about what that looks like and how we could as a state level, right, you talked a little bit about policy, what would that look like for us at a state level to establish what grooming looks like and codify that in some way? Yeah, um, Lucy, I definitely invite you if you'd like to jump in and share some information um, sure. to do so. Yep. Um, well, there are two bills passed that had, that talked about grooming, and one was um, that the uh, governor's council on child uh, abuse. I guess is that what it is? Um, As course on justice for abused children. Thank you. Would um, would put on their website uh, information about grooming. And it would, and then um, it would also go to every coach, every parent, and every child that's involved in a sport in sports. So um, information about what it is, how to recognize it, and what to do if you think it's happening. And so um, that's one that's one piece. And the other piece is in the um, human trafficking uh, legislation there will ask the uh, Trafficking in Persons Council to study grooming um, in regards to, <clears throat> excuse me, human trafficking. So it's definitely creating, there's some, there's uh, getting to be some inf information out about how important grooming is, to know about grooming, sorry. Looking okay. spoke. <laughs> No, thank you so much for uh, jumping in and sharing. I, you know, you're always the expert on this, so I appreciate that you're here and I can turn to you, um, you. for uh, sharing that information. Um, but yeah, it's definitely critical to uh, ensure that we continue to uh, evaluate um, what this could look like in policy. Um, and also, you know, we need to acknowledge what grooming looks like, right? So people can, um, and, you know, they, they have an opportunity to address it because they see that it's happening, but also we uh, want to ensure that we continue to educate them on how to intervene, um, you know, once they notice that happening, right? There's only so much uh, help that they can provide if they know what it looks like, but don't necessarily know or feel confident in responding. So I think continuing to uh, keep that in the narrative and potentially keep that in, in some of the uh, legislative language could definitely be a helpful way moving forward. Um, to ensure that this is actually addressed. Any other questions? Um, I see Larissa raise their hand. Yes. Uh, hi, everyone. So I have a two part question. One would be, are there any current talks about somehow including this in the school curriculum? about child, child sexual abuse prevention and how best to prevent these things from happening and teaching about grooming and all of that. Because I tend to notice that with everything that's in the works and what everyone is trying to do includes putting information on websites and putting just putting everything up there when the truth of the matter is that's not going to reach majority of the families because you do have a lot of families that don't even have time 
to go surf the web and search to find out these kind of information. What is there, or is there anything being proposed? That's the second question to actually make this information more accessible. I don't know if anyone can answer that um, on the legislative level or otherwise. We, somebody perhaps, Lucy or, oh, sorry, I might have lost folks. My, everybody's frozen on my screen. I don't, I don't know if you guys can hear me. Um, All right. Oh, are we back? Sorry, my computer got a little funky for a second. Mine did too. I think it's the office. <laughs> right. Um, okay. So we do actually, in the state of Connecticut, in 2016, we passed legislation that requires, it actually mandates all Connecticut K through 12 public institutions to do both awareness raising and prevention programming within school settings. The challenge with, and this is something that is not uncommon in our state, it be, although it's a mandate, there is no uh, uh, accountability essentially, right, for what happens when schools do not do it. So we're actually in the process right now in collaboration with the State Department of Education, the Department of Public Health, um, and a number of other folks who are more research epidemiologist oriented, um, looking at doing a survey with all K through 12 schools to just really identify where folks are at. Uh, we certainly have seen sort of anecdotally across the state that particularly elementary schools lag, right? And if you look at perpetration over, or victimization over the course of a lifetime, you really need to focus on young kids. Um, so it does exist. We did not do a curriculum. Connecticut does not mandate individual curriculums. What we, or curricula, what we did do is to create guidelines for here are the core things that we think in elementary, middle, and high school, every child and every educator must know to keep our kids safe and to be able to have um, you know, good conversation and to invite good conversation with kids in a school setting. So we actually have done a lot of it. It's just a matter of schools just really are not implementing the legislation and sort of taking to heart just how valuable it would be. We also hope I would say, uh, you know, in addition that because we've seen the numbers of childhood sexual abuse disclosures skyrocket after the pandemic, I expect we're gonna see the same thing when kids come back to school late August and September. Um, you know, that I think that schools might be a little bit more primed now to sort of understand their role specifically because kids tend to disclose in places, um, you know, that are where they have caring adults in their lives like school. So there really is a need. We just got to figure out how we get schools to actually take on those components of the legislation. Great. Thank you so much for such a thorough answer, Beth. I really appreciate it. I also want to say something. I think the schools too could utilize a screening tool. Um, similar to what they do with the homeless population, there's a CAN assessment and they screen them um, and then they refer them to resources in their community. There needs to be more like screening tools in the school because I have had clients that had childhood sexual assaults and it gone, it's gone on for years and years and nothing's being done. Um, so I think, you know, schools need to have more of a screening tool to help those that are in need. Absolutely. Yeah, that's definitely um, helpful feedback. So thank you for sharing. All right. Um, so seeing no further questions right now, um, I want to encourage folks to take a five minute break. Um, again, and just acknowledgement of the heaviness of this topic and the uh, Zoom fatigue that we've all become familiar with, I'm sure. Um, we're gonna step away um, and come back at 2.15. Uh, we'll reconvene um, and we will be discussing um, healthy sexual development uh, next. So um, we'll see everyone at 2.15 and um, thank you so much so far for all of your um, participation and for being present with us. I look forward to seeing you in five.
All right, seeing that it's uh, 2.15 now, um, we will be starting back up. Um, so um, I will hand it over to my co-facilitator, co wow, co-facilitator, <laughs> Kelsey, uh, to get started. All right, so we're gonna shift gears a little bit here. And this is actually a little bit of prevention that we're doing with you all, because uh, the more we know about healthy sexual development in kids and that we foster these values and, um, these behaviors, the safer kids are going to be. Um, and not that today's focus is all about prevention that's coming up in session three, but we did want to give you all sort of an overview of healthy sexual development in kids, um, because this is one way that we prevent certainly child to child um, sexual abuse. And we increase the likelihood that if a kid were to experience violence at the hands of an adult, that they would just, they would recognize that it was not okay and that they would disclose it um, to another adult. So healthy sexual development for kids, it is just as important as physical, emotional, cognitive development, all these other things that we think about with our young people in our lives all the time. Um, healthy sexual development, we want to also put that like top of the priority list. Some key things to think about um, when we are giving kids of all ages, and we're gonna talk about some, uh, there's lots of information out there about like specific things for specific age groups of kids, like information we can provide them and different behaviors we can encourage or discourage in them. We're not gonna get into all of those details today, but generally we wanna make sure that any information we are giving kids or conversations we're having with them, that it is accurate, uh, that it is, and that includes using like the correct names for body parts. That's a really important piece of this. We'll talk about why in just a second. Um, that we are giving developmentally appropriate information as much as possible. Not that we expect any of you to be child development psychologist type people, but um, that we are using information that feels appropriate for the age of the kid. Um, and that we are having conversations and providing information in a way that doesn't make a kid feel ashamed of themselves, of their body, of their feelings, about any of that. Kids who do not have access to this kind of information or people to have these conversations are more likely to develop unhealthy attitudes and beliefs about their own body, about their own sexuality, about their own feelings, and about other people with regard to all of those topics, okay? So this is, as I said, this is a prevention type thing that we're doing here. Um, and they're also likely, if they don't have an adult in their life that they trust to have conversations with about sex and sexuality, they're also likely to seek out that information from somewhere else, right? So one question I've got for folks, and you can unmute or you can um, put it in the chat or whatever you wanna do. Where do kids, you can think about your own experience as well. I'm sure we didn't all, I'll speak for myself. I did not have adults in my life that were willing to have any of these conversations with me when I was a kid. Um, I'm sure other folks can relate to that. Where do people get their information from as a kid? If you're not gonna ask your parents or caregivers or whoever about it, where might you get information about sex, sexuality, body parts, any of that kind of stuff? All right. In the chat, I'm seeing uh, the internet. Oh my gosh, so many answers. Um, Your peers. Yep, mm -hmm. peers um, who may or may not actually have the right information, right? Um, the internet, including porn and pornography, right? Um, older friends or siblings, TV, books, Google, cousins, right? So typically like a peer or maybe somebody a little bit older than us, the internet is just a big, dumping ground of good and bad information out there. And then just stuff that's on TV or stuff that's on YouTube or what have you, right? Um, one other piece about this, this goes back to the accurate information is that accurate information and specifically accurate language, we're gonna think of that as safety. Because if a kid wants to disclose something to an adult, particularly an adult who's outside their family, but they don't really have the right language to talk about some part of their body. Like maybe they have grown up in a family where the family has encouraged kids because adults feel uncomfortable sometimes using the words penis, vagina, vulva, et cetera. If they don't have adults in their lives teaching them those words and instead maybe they have like kind of a nickname for a part of their body, 
If that kid then tries to tell an adult outside the family about something that happened to them, that may get lost in translation, right? The adult may not really recognize what the kid is telling them. So we think of using correct, anatomically correct language to talk about body parts as a form of safety. So healthy sexual exploration. This is an important part. We got, we have to be able to recognize like there are behaviors that are, while they might, you know, seem a little strange to adults or they might make some of us feel a little bit uncomfortable. There are lots of behaviors that are just part of healthy sexual exploration for kids. And so recognizing what's the difference between something healthy and maybe something that needs to be addressed is really important. You do, do not feel like you need to write down this whole list that's up on your screen right now. I will send you this list. Um, but I just wanted us to sort of have a picture of what these might look like, right? Generally speaking, if kids are engaging in behaviors that are, you know, sexual, intimate, maybe feel a little bit inappropriate, but if it's with kids who are around the same age as them, um, people that they know really well, like kids that they play with all the time, kids who are sort of developmentally on the same wavelength as them, um, behavior that feels more like curious and exploratory rather than with like a specific intention or um, feels aggressive or hostile. Um, you'll note that being able to understand or like recognize if something is healthy or unhealthy, this all goes back to like adults need to be paying attention to what's going on in kids' lives and in their relationships and interactions with other kids, right? Um, we want kids to, we talked a little bit, I know some folks were mentioning before, like the importance of educating kids about consent, right? So if kids are in, engaging in behavior that's consensual, that's healthy. Um, if kids can sort of be easily redirected, like if, if an adult were to say to them, hey, actually that's something that we only do in, in private location, you know, we only do that in our own bedroom or in the bathroom or something. And then the kid sort of is like, oh, okay, I won't do that anymore not something we ne really need to be worried about. And generally, if a kid has a lot of other interests in their life, you know, they're, they're curious about nature and animals, they like to read, they like to play soccer, whatever, they've got all these other things. And this is just one component of who they are, right? That is really healthy, normal sexual development in kids. Something that might be potentially concerning um, when kids are sort of very preoccupied with a specific kind of behavior to the extent that it interferes with like other activities they might enjoy doing or they, they really aren't doing other things, they're really focused on this one potentially sexual or intimate or inappropriate behavior. Um, when there's a big age gap in the kids that are engaging in the behavior, we want to pay attention to that. Um, kids that have knowledge that is way beyond what other kids their own age typically have if they're very, very informed about behavior that is really just meant for adults or that kids really don't typically know about, that would be something to make note of. Um, any sort of behavior or play that is leading to complaints from other kids or complaints from other adults, um, certainly anything that leads to any like injury or emotional discomfort or pain or shame or any of those feelings. Kids who might use uh, like bribery or try to trick another kid into doing something with them, um, that's definitely of concern. Um, any behavior that seems to have the intention of hurting either another kid or an animal. Uh, behavior that specifically objectifies another person, right? So that is like making comments or um, yeah, making it clear that they are not viewing this other person as like a, a full other person with feelings and um, beliefs about what's right and wrong. Um, and then displays of sexual behavior in public, right? Which I'm sure many kids do something like that at some point, but if it's a thing that's happening a lot um, or if it's something that's not easily redirected, then that would be something of concern. Right. This is not a fully comprehensive list. Again, I will send you this whole list. Um, this is Cindy yeah, from, from Milford. Um, we have a couple of booklets that we use them very carefully because, as you said, many behaviors in children that might seem potentially concerning or what's normal and what isn't, you need to be careful because, with how you share. But there's a booklet out 
I'm going to look for an updated version. This was expanded in 2015 by Tony Cavanaugh Johnson. Mm -hmm. And it's called Understanding Children's Sexual Behaviors, What's Natural and What's Healthy. There's also another one put out by her uh, from 2016, Helping Children with Sexual Problem Behaviors for Professionals and Caregivers, both by Tony Cavanaugh Johnson. Right. Um, which we sometimes use or look at ourselves, depending on the situation, uh, even with parents. Yeah. Um, That's so. awesome, Cindy. Yeah. And this kind of information, I mean, the, the reason we're doing this Summer Institute is, especially for folks at our member centers, but also for anybody who's working with youth and families, um, we want you all to feel really confident having conversations about this topic with the people you're working with, right? So if there's other resources, um, Cindy, if you wanna send yeah. me the names of those in the chat, and then I'll add those to the, our follow-up email if people wanna keep an eye out for sure. that, um, that's great. And Lurce, I saw your, you had raised your hand too, go for it. Hi, ironically, I was just gonna ask Cindy to put the information in the chat, but I also wanted to add, um, earlier Sunny mentioned about a book, a children's book that just I wrote that just got released on this past Saturday and one of the reasons that prompted me to write this book and put special emphasis on the body parts the private parts for children is that I've been doing these campaigns in schools and I was amazed that well I didn't get to do it last year so back in 2019 with all the schools that we campaigned and we covered, I was totally amazed and floored at the fact that there were so many children still to this day and age that don't know the, the correct term for their private parts. And so that to me was just too much for me to um, really take and not do something about it. And so that's one of the reasons that prompted me to write this book. And another thing was that I realized that even in these talks and having these these discussions that there's not much emphasis being placed on the mouth as a private part. Mm -hmm. And I found out that there are a lot of children, of course, that's being sexually abused orally. And so it, it again, that was the basis behind me writing this children's book for children's ages three through seven. So I completely agree in everything that you've been saying. Um, I completely agree with you're so right. I just wanted to share that. Thank you. Thank you. If folks have other, and I, thank you also for just commenting on like that we need to expand our idea of what is considered like a private body part, right? And that it, there's there's so many different ways that unfortunately that you know people can could touch another person that makes them feel uncomfortable that are not focused specifically on like genitalia. Um, so that's a, a really important point. Um, and if anybody has, you know, if you've got a title of a book, um, a, a movie, a video, whatever, and you want to throw it in the chat, we will collect all of that stuff and add it to our follow-up email that we send out, because I'm sure we've got a wealth of knowledge here. Um, all right, I am going to keep us moving. So I want to just also acknowledge here for folks that even though we are people, I'm guessing all of us have conversations about sex, sexual violence, sexuality in our work, likely with, you know, the adults we work with or potentially in classrooms, if that's what we're doing every day or most days of the week. But I would love for folks to just do the little uh, hand raised hand reaction, or you can feel free to just actually raise your hand. Um, if you have ever felt uncomfortable answering a question about sex or sexuality or just like, a, you know, a kid said something that you were like, I don't know what to do with this. Just raise your hand if you've been in that situation before. I'm seeing so many raised hands. Okay, so just to just to validate that this is normal um, and it's something we want to work on, right? Because this is one of the ways that we help keep kids safe is we become those adults that they know are going to answer their questions honestly and thoughtfully and in a non-judgmental way. Um, very quickly, I will share one story from my own life and my, my previous days as a prevention educator working in schools. Um, I was in a probably sixth or seventh grade classroom um, and a kid came up to me at the end of class and asked me what a camel toe was. And I had no, I was like, man, I don't know how to answer that question. And I just, I'm not proud of this. I was like, 
you got to go home and ask someone in your family. <laughs> like I, that's not what I should have. I mean, I don't know what I should have said, to be honest. I don't know. I couldn't tell if he was joking or if he was serious. I should have just assumed he was serious, but from my own life, there's a somewhat embarrassing story for you all. So it's kind of hard. Um, so just if you feel sort of uncomfortable, whether that's within, you know, questions your own kids or nephews, nieces, cousins, whoever are bringing up or it ever comes up for you professionally and even that feels challenging, uh, you are not alone. Um, here are some things that you can do to get better at having some of these conversations. Um, you can get some support from other adults in your life, right? Talk to other parents, talk to friends, talk to coworkers, talk to family members. How are you navigating these conversations? Oh my gosh, guess what my kid asked me the other day? What would you have said, right? Ask questions like that. Uh, we also want you to practice, and we're going to give you some homework at the end of today before session two that involves some practice. Practice starting a conversation about some topic that you feel kind of uncomfortable about, right? Just get the words out of your mouth with somebody that you trust, with somebody who you know is not going to look at you like you're crazy if, uh, you know, you don't say exactly the right thing. Um, and if you are a person who just feels super, super confident having conversations about whatever a kid might want to have a conversation about, then your job is to try to pass this information on and this confidence on to other adults in your life, right? The people that are here with us today are probably the people who are already having conversations with young people about their bodies and about sex and about boundaries and all this important stuff. Um, you likely have other parents, other adults in your circle who are not as comfortable doing these things. So you got to find who those people are and try to model some of those conversations with them or just talk to them like, hey, have you ever talked to your kids about X, Y, and Z, right? One takeaway I want us all to take away from today's workshop is that if we are serious about preventing child sexual abuse, which I know every single one of us is, the way that that happens is when all adults are all in all the time on this issue, right? So that includes not just all of us here today, but all of the other adults who are not here today, right? All right, I'm gonna pass it back over to Bridget. All right, hey everyone. Um, so we wanna consider what actions um, all adults can take to build healthy communities for children. Um, so starting with um, child to child, uh, child sexual assault. Um, it's important that um, children are monitored during their social time with peers, right? We put so much emphasis on children not being left alone with other adults, but again, in recognizing 30 to 50% of these situations um, involve peers, we want to um, ensure that children continue to be monitored in those spaces. Um, we also um, want to consider power bases that might exist. Um, in these situations. So in peer relationships, um, there may be differences in age, size, developmental stages, or other power dynamics that um, could, uh, you know, continue to facilitate that sexual violence. So um, it's important to consider those power bases when children are engaging with others. Um, it's also important that we ensure we're building healthy relationship skills and engaging in conversations about boundaries and consent in a way that applies to both adults and to children. So we often talk about, you know, um, not allowing other adults to touch a child's body, but we should also um, ensure that they understand that other children shouldn't be doing that either. We need to be very mindful about our language. Um, so for instance, the phrase good touch, bad touch has been very uh, popular over the years, right? It's one of those buzzwords along with, you know, stranger danger. Um, but this is important to move away from because it doesn't, um, you know, the idea of a bad touch doesn't uh, necessarily cover confusing situations, which is the case for a lot of children who are potentially being groomed, who may even feel like the touch physically felt good, but emotionally made them uncomfortable, right? Um, so moving away from the structure of good touch, bad touch allows us to create space for children to share more nuanced emotions. Are they uncomfortable? Are they scared? Are they unsure? Maybe they're experiencing a grooming situation that has not yet escalated and this gives them more space to address that, right? Um, so in being mindful about our language, as Kelsey had shared, we also want to understand and use anatomically correct terms for genitals. 
um, so that a children can disclose in a way that is very um, upfront and um, understandable to the adults around them, right? But also so that we're not creating a level of shame around these parts of the child's body, right? If we can't even call it something, then there must be something uncomfortable about it, right? We teach children not to use the names for their genitals, and we also teach them not to use swear words. So what message are we sending um, in not kind of creating space for children to use these anatomically correct uh, words? Um, Bridget, also want yes. I'm sorry, just to expand, and, and if Linda, if she's listening, she can certainly um, chime in here. Linda's part of the community education. They expand that good touch, bad touch concept to include something that, depending on the age of the child, it's really for younger children, is a confusing touch. Because as you said, it may not feel good like, you know, a hug at night by mom or dad, or, uh, but it might also not necessarily feel bad, like getting hit or punched or kicked, um, mm -hmm. but a confusing touch and how to identify it. And they kind of give different examples of how a confusing touch might make you feel. So I do know that they had um, been using that to expand upon that good touch, bad touch. Yeah. Um... And I can definitely appreciate that. I think, um, you know, in some of the research that they've done with um, children and, you know, regards to these topics, they find that, um, you know, children, when they're presented with a binary, really tend to think within that binary. Um, so when they have this, you know, good touch, bad touch, um, they're going to think that these, uh, that something would need to fall into one of those categories, right? Um, but we understand sexual violence uh, to be something that exists on a spectrum. And we talked about kind of that trajectory of violence that occurs in cases of CSA. So it's definitely important that we don't um, necessarily always uh, fit things into uh, boxes or create binaries in the way that we present them, um, just because of the way children might, um, you know, not uh, have space for that nuance the same way we as adults would. So I can definitely appreciate, um, you know, what you're saying and kind of creating more space for uh, confusing situations, right? Um, so it's also, I'm sorry. Um, adding on to that, Bridget, uh, we've always used um, for a long time appropriate and inappropriate touches or behaviors. And it's the kids like it because we actually have to sound it out and everything else so they get to know. And we actually tell them it's like, it's inappropriate means it's something that's yucky that feels inside yucky. You know, um, the outside may feel different, but on the inside, it feels yucky and on, uh, appropriate. It's something that feels okay inside and it doesn't make us feel yucky. So it kind of brings it down to their level. Mm -hmm. So that's worked for us for years. So, yeah, no. And again, I can, um, you know, appreciate and yeah. understand seeing, um, some of this on, um, seeing some of this on more of, uh, a spectrum, right. And, um, you know, and seeing that something is not necessarily non-abusive or abusive, right? Comfortable and uncomfortable leaves more space for a child to express that they are feeling, you know, uncomfortable versus experiencing like a bad touch or abuse. Um, but we do want to just acknowledge that again, children are in a position where they might be experiencing something that's a very nuanced experience, right? They could have what is a good touch with mom might not be a good touch with their teacher, right? Um, they could be hugging mom and that feels safe, but their teacher hugging them feels unsafe, right? So we want to kind of just wherever we can create space for nuance. Um, so I appreciate that, you know, folks do that in different ways and have their own phrases and programs to describe it. But I think, um, you know, the takeaway here is just that we want to ensure that there is um, nuance um, in the way that we kind of present that to whatever extent that, you know, we can. Um, so we also want to, you um, uh, model behavior, right, and use teaching moments so that children um, can better understand um, some of these ideas. We want to model healthy relationships for them, right, uh, in our relationship with them and the relationships that they see in our lives. We want to um, model emotional and self-regulation and really teach them that their actions impact others. Um, we can do that by, uh, you know, sharing examples with them. We can use moments, right, where they might have made someone else upset or um, uncomfortable or someone else made them upset or uncomfortable to have those conversations. Um, but it's important that they have some of that self-regulation understood. Um, so we also want to, of course, model empathy 
Um, we want to engage in conversations about empathy, right? What does it mean? Why is empathy important? Um, we want to apply it to um, situations the same way we would, uh, you know, emotional and self-regulation, apply it to a certain situation and relate it to their own emotional experiences, right? Because children have some level of self-centeredness where it's easier for them to understand if they can relate it to their own experience in that way. So talk about a time where they were feeling a certain way and explain, explaining that that's very close to what somebody else might be feeling in this situation. Um, we want to uh, demonstrate our empathy, right? Um, when we are, when we are um, experiencing that empathy, make it clear to a child that that's what we are experiencing so they see it modeled for them. Um, we uh, also want to demonstrate our empathy to them, right? So if we see that child upset, we want to be empathetic to that. Um, if we're seeing them feel a certain way, we want to model that empathy um, to A, ensure they understand it better, right? But also because this continues to build trust with that child um, and build on that relationship. Um, we want to teach them to help others. Um, you know, if their peer needs help in a situation, knowing that they can say something to us about it, um, creating that empathy, um, you know, uh, you know, or, you know, modeling that empathy and then having that child understand empathy better um, can lead them to potentially uh, understanding that a time has come where, right, they, they might need to say something because they're acknowledging somebody um, is feeling uncomfortable, but creating space for them to have those conversations is important. Um, we want to have discussions around body language and facial expression. This is important and of course, picking up that it's time to say something, but we want to use teachable moments. So um, for instance, um, we want to, uh, if they're in a situation where they're, you know, leaving a friend's house and their friend has their arms crossed and their head is down and they're shaking their head, that's a friend that probably doesn't want to hug, right? So having conversation, having a conversation about that um, with the child um, to sort of understand um, what that body language means. This is also really helpful, um, you know, role play activities and charades and things of that nature to build these skills um, can be really critical in their understanding. We of course wanna teach bodily autonomy. So we wanna teach them about the bodily autonomy that they and others have through both demonstration and conversation. So we want um, this them to have some, again, I mentioned we were gonna uh, circle back to the idea of privacy. Um, it's important that they do have a level of age appropriate privacy and independence, right? So um, when they are at an age where they can you know, adequately bathe themselves, where they can clean their genitals, right? where um, potentially they could have a diary and they could write in that diary and nobody else is going to read that diary. Um, there are appropriate ways for a child to have uh, some level of independence and autonomy. And we wanna honor that um, to ensure that they start to build that with themselves. Um, and as Kelsey mentioned, of course, um, you know, in handling questions about sex, it's important that they're handled in an appropriate health-based way. Um, you know, we want to use that anatomically correct language. We don't want to create shame. And we want to answer the question um, that they asked in acknowledging that they might not need or want more information, right? We don't just want to start that ball rolling and, um, and explain everything um, about that certain topic to them. Um, if they just ask one question, we can answer that question and honor other questions that come, um, but don't need to overshare um, if that's not something that they are potentially ready for a conversation about. Um, and they may be uncomfortable in a case where they hear a bit, uh, a bit more than they were ready for. So this is a resource um, that is particularly helpful in uh, having conversations about, um, about uh, sex and consent with children. Um, so I'll put it in the chat, but also we'll be emailing it out after. Um, and I um, also um, wanted to um, acknowledge, you know, we were going to discuss online environments today, but Kelsey and I did uh, check in with one another. And just given the amount of content that we have for everyone today, we want to give you an opportunity to ask questions um, and potentially debrief. So we're going to um, move that to our next uh, session um, in order to just provide more time for all of you to um, ask questions, process this information, et cetera, rather than try and, and jam it all into this session. So we appreciate your understanding of that. Uh, if this is something you were particularly looking forward to, perhaps, um, and uh, 
with that, I will hand it over to uh, Kelsey to um, introduce our next piece here. All right, we are going to send you into breakout rooms for a few minutes in just a second. But first, I will send this out in the follow up email. I just wanted to uh, introduce your homework. So over the next, you've got almost a month to do it. Um, because practice is real. This is not just about like, getting a bunch of new knowledge, but we actually have to do some new behavior as a result of this training. Um, we want you to practice. Probably you've got a colleague here with you today that you work with. They would be a great person to practice with. Having a conversation, imagine you can come up with whatever scenarios you want in your head. Um, a conversation with a young person about something they're doing that's making another kid uncomfortable or that you are recognizing as a concerning behavior and practice having a conversation with an adult who's also doing something like that, okay? You don't need to like role play out the whole thing. It's more about getting the conversation started and like, what are you gonna say to this person to let them know you're concerned? Obviously those two conversations are gonna sound different. That's your homework. We are gonna check in with you about it at our July session, so please do it. And try to make note of like how it felt, how did it go? Do you feel like this kind of conversation, you could do it in the future, et cetera, all right? So that's homework. And now I'm gonna send you into some breakout rooms for just a few minutes, maybe like six or seven minutes, I'm gonna say, um, to just sort of process a little bit. I know it's not gonna be a lot of time, how you're feeling, what you're thinking about, what you're walking away still wondering about sort of the initial information we gave you today. Okay, um, so give me one second to get those going. If anybody's got any, and we will come back and have some time for just general Q&A after that's over. So if you've got a question, just make note of it. Um, I'm gonna make, all right, you might just be going back into the rooms you were in earlier because it's a lot of work to change them. So here we go. I moved a couple of folks that were in a room on their own. Thank you. No problem. I forgot to change the time on that. So they're only gonna actually have like four minutes <laughs> to do this. <laughs> Whoops. Um, did you want folks to share when they get back or did you just want to provide them with an opportunity in their group? Um, I think if we want to hear, maybe we could encourage folks to share in the chat mm -hmm. and if maybe like one or two people we want to hear out loud. I think we have time for that and then time for some Q&A. Yeah, I mean, even if we start the Q&A with five minutes to go, anybody who is wants to engage to that extent can stay on. I can also get the evaluation link correct. 
Oh, cool. Thank you. We'll have to see, but um, yeah, it would be nice. All right, welcome back everyone. That was even shorter than I told you it was gonna be. Um, I would love to hear <clears throat> from two people, just something that you shared or that was shared in your group. And if other folks wanna just add in the chat, sort of you know, what generally are people thinking about or feeling, that would be awesome. Um, I'll share something that I shared in, in our group, which was that uh, I worked in residential camping for a long time. Um, and it, you know, when I go to a training and they talk about the behaviors and things like that, um, it makes me think of one that the camp I worked at did a really good job in training staff how to like recognize some of these behaviors and putting these in place to, uh, you know, reduce any risk to kids. So like staffing ratios, never being one-on-one -on -one with the kid, never having kids being one-on-one -on -one with each other, things like that. Um, and just, you know, kind of wondering like how many youth serving organizations don't have those policies in place. Thanks, Sarah. It's also, thank you so much for sharing that uh, you worked at a place that did a really good job because it's just really helpful to be reminded that there are places doing a great job out there and to have a little bit of positivity to hold on to. Thank you for sharing that. Anybody else? And we've got um, in the chat, uh, Marisol, thank you for saying. So thinking about like, how does somebody act? What do we actually say to an adult or a person who's um, behaving inappropriately? Like, what are those words? That's a great question. Um, and that's what we are hopefully encouraging you all to think about in your homework. Um, but to just get, I guess, just to answer that question, I, this is one answer. There's, there are many answers to this question, but um, to be, to be transparent and, and to speak about what you're seeing, right. And to speak about the specific behavior that you're seeing, right. I don't think it's super helpful to say something like, um, you know, you're acting creepy <laughs> or the way you're acting is, I think it's weird, right? Like that is, we gotta be specific and say like, um, I, you know, I think Bridget's example before of like, I've noticed that you are constantly like sitting with the kids and sort of not engaging with the adults. And that makes me feel a little concerned. And I would like to talk about why that's happening and that it makes me uncomfortable, right? Um, and yeah, and Sarah, to your point about like when people get, defensive, like we can't be responsible for somebody's reaction to us pointing out that they're doing something that's a problem. Um, that doesn't make it, that makes it, makes it challenging when somebody gets defensive. Absolutely. Um, and I think back to what Bridget was saying about like, we just have to be confident that like we are pointing something out. We know what we're seeing. Um, it might be helpful to like, maybe there are other adults who have also witnessed it. Um, that could also, I think sometimes having more people 
present like, yep, this is also making me feel uncomfortable. That can be helpful sometimes. Um, and I think it's important to see that defensiveness as unfortunately potentially another red flag, right? Because most adults, if they're in a situation in which another adult says, hey, I think you're doing something that um, is, is, you know, making this child uncomfortable, you know, most adults would step back and say, oh my gosh, like, I'm so sorry, you know, I didn't want that to be the case. I don't, you know, want to make a child uncomfortable. I want to engage in this conversation. And that defensiveness um, is is uh, a red flag in and of itself. So I think that that should be acknowledged as well. This is probably, if this is something that folks want some more attention on, we can also bring this to our next session as well, because there's I, there's only five minutes left right now. And I think this is, we could have a much longer conversation about this. Um, feel free to put that in your evaluation, but I'm also just making a note of it now. Speaking of which, um, I'm going to be putting uh, an evaluation for today's training in the chat. Um, and I just encourage you all to take some time to fill it out um, just uh, so that it can help inform the rest of our training programs in general, but also the rest of the Institute series. If there's a particular topic you'd like to hear more about later uh, in the summer, we would really uh, like to ensure we're including it. Um, so please feel free to, uh, to spend some time. Just a few minutes would be so, so incredibly helpful to us and everybody else in the session. Um, so thank you in advance um, for doing that. Jane Kelsey, would you spend just a couple minutes talking? This is one of the things that we talked about in our group just now. Uh, we're just talking about how we're sort of framing out the next two sessions so folks know what to expect and sort of what we'll spend some more time delving into. Yeah. So our next session, which is on July 20th and is actually scheduled to be, we gave it uh, three hours with a break, I promise. And also if we are done before three hours, we will let you go. <laughs> I know that the thought of sitting on Zoom for three hours is really unappealing to everyone. Um, we, the, the plan, and now there's some other stuff we will add to this, is we've got um, someone coming in from the Office of the Child Advocate to talk about that office as a resource, um, specifically when we, some folks are probably familiar with what OCA does, other folks might not be, um, but when we are, we feel like other adults or institutions are not following through on their responsibility to keep kids safe, the Office of the Child Advocate is a resource. And so um, Sarah Egan is going to be with us and talk about that. Um, we've also got somebody, I believe, coming in from DCF to talk a little bit more about the mandated reporting process. Not so much, we know that you all know like how to make a mandated report, how to call and how to do that, but more like what to expect afterwards. And also just to give you all a time to ask questions of this person and, and whatever you've encountered in your roles um, and situations that maybe you felt unsure about or were not sure about the way that they handled it, like to ask questions. Um, we will add also the piece about online environments that we didn't get to today. And we'll come back to this uh, like concrete, actual sentences you can use to talk to an adult um, about their behavior. The third session is focused on prevention um, from both from like a, we've got folks that are working in schools, working with parents, working in communities. Um, what are some best practices for CSA prevention in those environments? And then also what can folks be doing if you're working just with a family, right? Or just with a kid and a parent or like, a, you know, really small insular group of people. Um, what are conversations that you could be having with those folks to prevent instances of sexual abuse or further instances? And that one's in August. I forgot the date offhand, but I'm sure you all have got it. So just to wrap up with uh, two minutes left, um, but please, um, again, we will hang out if anybody has questions or uh, needs to process anything. So we will not be jumping off in a minute, but in case you need to, um, we just want to put in, out a reminder about your self-care. So look at what you wrote down earlier and commit again, to doing that when your work day is over today. So I will indeed be uh, snuggling my little dog and playing with him and getting to bed early. <laughs> um, and I uh, hope that you take part in all the wonderful self-care that you shared with us as well. Um, we also just want to acknowledge again that this was difficult. Um, you know, it's an issue we all um, obviously care about. That's why, you know, we're here, right? Um, but there is some uh, empowerment to be found in calling ourselves and others into prevention. And that is truly our intention with this program. 
Um, so um, Kelsey, if you wanted to jump in with any last, uh, last words here. Just, I hope you all are, I'm sure we're all leaving with a lot of different feelings. Um, I said this at the very beginning and I just wanna repeat that there are reasons to feel hopeful about our ability to keep kids safe, right? And I think hearing a lot of, Bridget shared a lot of um, actual stories and experiences that she was in, you know, involved with or knew about um, in her work. And that's, that's a lot to carry, um, which is why we're emphasizing the self-care so much. Um, but even with all of that, like we, we know more about how to keep kids safe and how to do effective prevention than we did, I don't know, 10 years ago. I don't know exactly when things started to shift, but there's reasons to be hopeful. And just to remember that today, I think when everybody was here, we had maybe like about 40 There's people. Um, and so there were like 40 adults on today's session. There's we're here because we There's care about, whoops, because we care about keeping kids safe. We care about doing a better job in our own communities, right? And I, and I trust that all of us are gonna go out into our own like circles of adults and continue having these conversations, right? And that's how we're gonna see things start to change. As Bridget said, we will, we're will. we gonna hang out for a little bit. So if anybody wants to chat or check in about anything, feel free to just stay. Um, otherwise, thank you all so much for being here and we'll see you in July. Right. Um, Kelsey, if you don't mind switching the slide, it'll have our email addresses as well. If anybody wanted to jot that down and um, reach out that way. We'll also be sending out a couple of resources. So keep an eye out for that email uh, from us. But if you wanna contact us uh, and don't wanna stick around, um, feel free to, to contact either of us there. Well, Thank you. Know. Of course.